Back in the 1950s and the 1960s and the 1970s, the United States government had programs, some involving simple surveillance, some involving ways of getting information, some involving plots, basically to frame people for crimes, and some involving outright murder. It was secret at the time because it was by and large illegal. Really what COINTELPRO is, is you know, a militarization of uh, criminal justice. It was a code word that was used by the FBI, actual war against the entire left movement. To eliminate, intimidate, incarcerate, and terrorize a people. It was a covert war strategy, and it was done because the government thought there was a war going on. risk of seeming ridiculous, a true revolutionary is guided by a great feeling of love. El Mano Ernesto Che Guevara. Along the lines of Al's question, do you know of educational materials for, we'll say, progressive communities, activist communities, radical communities, so people can educate themselves to, we'll say, these, this history and learn from this history so people are learning the different techniques the FBI are using and to inoculate ourselves when we feel like we're being divided, you know, these different techniques that they've used, and, um, you know, just, and because they're all, because they, you know, there's, there's some same, and then there's new things, you know, the FBI is very active in Rochester targeting low income. There was a RICO case two years ago where the FBI came in, and, and low level people involved in low level drug um, activity, and just divided this whole community, and everybody was been put to, put away for a long time and people that did not have any was not money was not a large racketeering organization but this was just another technique the FBI was is testing you know they test these different techniques in different communities to see the responses um, you know it was a, a, one you know one day they do the earth earth first roadblock in um, Indiana they tested a technique there and then two days later they came to rot they did their crackdown in Rochester and tested this and this and low-income black community in Northeast part of Rochester. I'm just wondering if there are, that you know, like a curriculum or educational materials for communities to educate themselves as their way to sort of, or are the people sort of working on that? Well, we put some curriculum online, okay. some ideas for yeah. it, but we want that to be an interactive process. I'm sure there's other things out there. I, you know, I don't think there's any one answer. Right. We know that. And right. And you know, RICO has a long history. RICO itself is, you know, not a it's not a new phenomenon for the government to use the RICO laws. I mean they've been used in in situations that you're describing, they've also been used politically at various points as well. Sort of like the the ultimate conspiracy thing that they create and and round people up with. So um, when you say, you're saying, is the, is the website COINTELPRO, is this the website? This is on our website, freedomarchives.org. Freedom yeah, if you go to the COINTELPRO page, there's a, an area for curricula and there's an area for um, additional resources. And we've tried to be fairly extensive about it. And, you know, like we've, uh, you know, we reference material, for example, on the targeting of the women's movement, um, you know, on, on anti gay and lesbian at the time it was called, you know, targeting of those movements. Um, so, you know, I think if, if people 
put some healthy energy into it, we can actually fill that out even more. And there are people who are doing more current research on, you know, how does pop, you know, population mapping work? There are target programs in various parts of the country. I know one of them is in Watsonville, California, not too far from us, where they go in and they actually try to figure out, you know, on a very sophisticated level, you know, and this is a, you know, largely working class in Chicano, um, agriculturally based economy in Watsonville. They've gone in and actually mapped, <coughs> done a population map of who's who in the community and who interacts and who's part of what. I mean, it's very sophisticated stuff now. When you say you that, know, you're talking about the feds? I'm talking about the federal government. I mean, it's not only them, you right, know. I mean, it's, you know, there are fusion centers, for example. If you don't know what a fusion center is, try to find out what fusion <coughs> centers are. You know, there's the military aspect, and there's the data mining aspect of it, you know, where the coordination of, you know, federal and local cops and all that stuff happens. Um, I mean, it's high level. You know, there was a 60 Minutes piece on three weeks ago on Lower Manhattan you know, in the great anti-terrorism work of the NYPD, where they have 2,000 cameras now, soon to be 3,000. And they, 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 the example that they showed on um, CBS was, okay, uh, tell the computer to locate um, everybody wearing a red shirt. And within like two seconds, all the monitors showed people in different parts of lower Manhattan who were wearing red shirts. And, you know, like two years ago, this would have taken two weeks. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you know, what does that say about the kind of surveillance, you know, thing that they're creating? I mean, it has huge, more, much more powerful, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, that you shouldn't wear a red shirt when you're in lower <laughs> Manhattan, but, uh, but, you know, I mean, this is the kind of thing that they're, they're constantly working it up, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to keep up with our understanding of it, I think. Um, not that that'll protect us against it. So the other side of the equation, I think, is, you know, how do we look at the kind of human relations that we are involved in and conduct in our lives and in our communities, among ourselves, because the vulnerability of that, as we see, you know, with a lot of these cases, you know, the kind of vulnerability of people who are, you know, somehow victimized and damaged by the system and how that plays out and how that opens us up to the issues of infiltration. I mean, you can't protect, I mean, Marrero ended up mm. sleeping with Evelyn, you know, and they had a kid. I mean, how, how do you know? You can't necessarily know. But there's some situations where, you know, why do you want to work with a heroin addict in your midst? You know, it's like it doesn't make sense mm -hmm. to do that and want to involve yourself in extra legal or, you know, some kind of activity with somebody who you know is like totally dependent on some heavy drug thing. You know, that's mm -hmm. crazy big surprise when they turn on you later on and become a cooperating witness when the squeeze is put on, you know. I mean, it's just stupid stuff, I think. I mean, not, I'm not belittling the politics necessarily that are behind it, but, you know, if, if we're serious, we have to, like, be pretty mindful of, you know, how we're doing stuff. So I've got Leslie, Mary, Susan and Kathy. And I kind of want to cut it there. And maybe, maybe Pete, depending on how, how we go. Um, you've all spoken. You mind if I let Pete jump stack just because he hasn't spoken? And then um, we'll continue on this route. Well, I was just curious. You said uh, you were making an effort to try to get this into the schools. I was wondering what kind of reception you were getting and resistance depending on the school district, the communities you were, you well, were we working have, with? Uh -huh. We have to rely on somebody in the school to do it. I mean, we don't call the superintendent's office and say, hey, you know, we have this radical 
thing that we want to <laughs> impose on your high school social studies classes. Because I, you know, I mean, I'm not belittling your question. I mean, um, I mean, there's tremendous limits to what we can do. On the other hand, this old friend of mine, um, you know, was the principal of an alternative high school in Seattle, and so he came to a showing that we did in the community. He says, man, I really want to see if we can get some kids to a school assembly. So they made this voluntary assembly thing and, you know, like 80% of the school showed up. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we got in there because he was willing to take a chance and was jazzed by the film. And, you know, it's like he felt like he had the room to do that. So it was like really amazing. And then everybody went back after the film to their little I mean, they're structured more in talking circles rather than formal classroom things. And they had these, I mean, I went to one of them. And, um, you know, it was like pretty mind-blowing to me. I was just like, yeah, it's like, these kids are really smart. I mean, everyone thinks they're the stupidest kids in the school system, right? Because they don't get good grades. But really, they're streetwise and they understand this shit. You know, they know what's, they know what's going on. And that was very cool. And so, uh, you know, uh, we work in, with this school called Met West that's not that different. It's a high school for that kind of focuses on social justice issues. And, you know, we show it every semester we have since it's come out. And we get students from there to work with us because of that. So, you know, it's like chipping away here and there, you know, but somebody else could do that just as well as, you know, we don't have to be the ones doing that kind of work. So if you're a teacher or know a principal who's progressive, you know, get it into a school, you know, or do something like that, you know. Have we found that there's any uh, reference uh, referrals from some of the schools that you've already gotten it into to, you know, with other, other schools? More on the college level, you know. Particularly uh, people, you know, depart ethnic studies departments, Americana studies, you know, the kind of, mm -hmm. you know, some of the few places where there's actually challenging stuff going on in higher education. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, we're getting, we get requests. Um, so that's cool. I go to lesson. Yeah, I was hoping you could give us at least a clip notes on your case and uh, the time on the lamb and prison. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, uh, cliff notes. All right, real quick though. I've been talking too much. Um, uh, I, I started doing media, okay, I laid that out. But, you know, at some point doing media was frustrating enough that I became more of like a political organizer and stuff. And uh, I'd, you know, certainly been around like the Panthers and anti war stuff. Got involved with the Puerto Rican independence movement in the early 70s um, and ended up doing clandestine stuff. Got involved in a conspiracy to break Oscar Lopez Rivera out of Leavenworth, who, you know, at that time was one of many Puerto Ricans who were locked up uh, on seditious conspiracy charges. Seditious conspiracy is basically politically the expression of wanting to fight for an end to colonialism, but which is criminalized by the U.S. government as being a, you know, a threatening act. And uh, so, yeah, we didn't succeed because uh, that was infiltrated from within Leavenworth by somebody who had something to gain uh, by being cooperating with um, the feds. And, um, uh, the fuller story is actually in my partner's book, which is on the back table, called Arm the Spirit, that Leslie has on the table. It's published by AK Press uh, in, in a memoir that she published recently. But, you know, uh, we did find a device on our car. It meant that we were able to short circuit this task force of 100 plus people who um, had us under surveillance. And basically, we got out of the net and um, kept it together and eventually we did negotiate a non-cooperative surrender that involved no debriefing and uh, the idea at that point because there were six adults and four kids mm. was that we felt ineffective by now it's the mid 90s 
and we wanted to plug back into uh, political organizing and stuff, which everybody has done. Two of us did time. Um, no kid was separated from both parents, so that was good. Uh, they weren't all uh, uh, heterosexual normative relationships either in the group, so that was mm -hmm. an important struggle that we wanted to wage with the, with the feds and one, you know, to like not use any vulnerabilities of that kind to fuck with people or the kids especially. And uh, yeah, so did time and, you know, I told you the part of the story that has to do with the archives, but I mean, it's been my passion to get back to doing media work even though you know, I did other stuff, and, and this is part of it. Uh, so your question was about uh, what's going on in, Cal in California with the hunger strike, which, of course, is an outgrowth of a lot of things, including what happened in Georgia and Ohio. Uh, it's not an isolated thing, but clearly um, a significant struggle because it emerges from Pelican Bay, a control unit prison, which we kind of described and people know <coughs> what that is. Um, and the fundamental demands of the first strike in July were really about human rights issues. It's the nature of prolonged isolation and what that is about. Why, why do they do that and how come they can do that is one of the demands. One of the ways that people are locked up for indeterminate periods of time is through what's called gang val validation. Gang validation is really an extension of gang validation on the streets. Um, in the Bay Area there are gang injunctions that prescribe that certain people who are named have no longer any right to associate with any of the other members of that group and have special curfews and all that stuff. There's a big struggle happening in the Bay Area around gang injunctions. But, you know, this gang jacketing, which the cops do, follows people into prison. And in the state of California, if you're gang jacketed, if you're validated as a gang member, off to the shoe or off to a controlled prison you go. And uh, the only way you can get out is by becoming a snitch. Mm -hmm. The only way you can come out is to debrief. So one of the demands of the California prison strikers is about this process. N not only challenging the gang validation, but the process of how do you get out of this interminable, you know, decades of isolation stuff. Um, and the courts aren't, you know, buying into challenging this on any human rights grounds. So, you know, people are willing to die over it. So the first strike happened and they actually got the officials of the Department of Corrections to sit down and not only negotiate directly with some of the people who emerged as leaders, but there was a mediation team and all that other stuff. And they conceded to give them uh, beanies in cold weather and crayons in their cells, essentially, which was bullshit. And the prisoner said, ah, you know, this is nothing. <coughs> We're not accepting it. So they decided, they said, we're giving you, you know, X amount of time to be more serious or we're going to start it again. So, of course, the, the prison did nothing of the sort and they started the hunger strike the second time, now in its third week. And um, at its peak, there were 12,000 prisoners refusing food. But, and this is based on the state's numbers. So there was probably even more, which is a huge, huge, I mean, when was the last time you were in a demonstration of 12,000 people, right? Just imagine what that looks like being organized from inside the locked down bowels of, you know, the California prisons. And um, so that, it, you know, I mean, it's having impact because it's also freaking out the prison. It's not in one prison, it's in lots of prisons. Are um, these prisons privatized? No, these are not privatized prisons. These are all run by the state of California. And, you know, state of California prisons are under federal receivership because of challenges to both overcrowding and horrific medical conditions. And, you know, the retribution around the strike is, you know, turn the air conditioning on, <coughs> blow a blast, 
you know, and things, a level of harassment on wave two of the strike that is just beyond belief. And they're doing things like offering a tray um, in, in a door slot that has, you know, liquid and f solid food. And if you refuse the solid food but accept the liquid to not dehydrate, they, they don't count you as a hunger striker. Mm -hmm. So we know the numbers are greater. Mm -hmm. um, I got an email um, just you know, late this afternoon <coughs> that, that there was some acceptable reason to stop for people in Pelican Bay, one of the prisons, but that the other prisons were maintaining their hunger mm -hmm. strike. It's really hard to tell because the main lawyers have been prevented from going into the prisons any longer. Mm -hmm. So the communications have been totally cut off. <coughs> So what is really happening, I mean, this is the early communication says that Pelican Bay has agreed for the time being to go back to eating because of some thing being offered them. But, you know, these folks are not going to take more beanies as an answer because they're right about their human rights. <coughs> and what's happened on a public level is a huge upsurge and co much more coordinated effort on the part of smaller prison organizers who you know may or may not have worked together at various points but it's really coalesced this much broader thing and there's been um, there's one a, a progressive politician out of San Francisco who's the head of the State Assembly's Public Safety Committee that held some amazing hearings in Sacramento, which what that revealed was this um, huge participation by family members who aren't traditionally part of the organized left or anything like that, but it created a space for them to come and people mobilized and helped these folks come to Sacramento to <coughs> testify about the impact, you know, as they experienced it to, you know, their son, husband, whomever, because this is m happening largely in the men's prisons. And, um, uh, you know, it was like really amazing. So uh, one of my favorite examples of gang validation uh, testimony is this young African-American woman who's in her third year of law school who tells the story, uh, my brother's been, you know, like whatever it was, eight years so far in Pelican Bay, and he was gang validated for reading George Jackson, which was required reading for me when I got my BA. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's like, yeah, like how crazy is that, right? Of course, they're afraid of things like George Jackson because the, you know, politics within the California prisons in the 1970s was very conscious politically, and you know, that's the main thing that they fear is a much larger level of political consciousness inside on top of the you know the you know the fed up with the conditions thing is that grows into something that is more self-consciously part of movement building then they've really lost control over their social control thing you know which is what the prisons are about so it's like totally in flux and totally heavy and, uh, and you know, there's been solidarity stuff happening around other parts of the country around it. I know there was some stuff in, in New York City. I don't know where else, but um, I mean, I, California, there's been several things a week in various parts of the state. And, and as I mentioned, a lot of family, you know, we're talking about a lot of prisoners and all these family members are stepping up and, you know, giving testimony. Um, and you know, it's just like incredibly moving stuff. So, thanks for the question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so we'll do uh, Susan and then end with Kathy. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask um, one of the things that uh, I see that I don't know if it's changed or I just have, you know, because I'm part of it. But it seems like in the the indie media has grown, but also it's also become a target. Like um, when I've been to large 
gatherings and all the cameras. It's amazing. But then I also saw, like at the RNC, them targeting the the journalists and that because, you know, they've they've managed to corporatize all the media, basically, most of the media. So the indie media is the ones that are reporting what's really going on. And um, do you think uh, what's your feelings as far as, you know, the the all out attacks on, on the independent media and, um, you know, trying to shut them down, um, not only the act as like activist groups and trying to um, squelch another part of the voice and the press. And also, as you said, you were a media person. The idea of the, you know, leg how how is you know like I, I look at here like we're denied as Rochester New Media and you know getting into places because you know they don't consider us real media and and building something to get this independent media and the, the independent <coughs> sources so that they are because I consider myself a journalist I, I you know I don't think being paid or going to school makes you a journalist it's reporting on what's going on right. and dissemination of information just like you do um, right. so um <coughs> i guess that was and i also had the question mary asked me <laughs> asked it so um that was the other one i mean i just have a comment because i think you you were very cogent in what you said and i certainly agree with you i mean the you know i think it's I think it's important to make a struggle, but I also think it's futile in a lot of cases to, to aspire to a level of legitimacy when you're asking them to legitimize the role that you play when you know, you're, you're more than a journalist, you're actually an advocate, and that's a good thing. You know? And so, um, you know, uh, these little things are cool, you know? We, we pick them up for like less than ten dollars each for our kids you know in our program and they can go out and shoot in HD and get pretty good sound and we say look you know take this in the streets and when the cops are doing shit don't worry about who you are do it you know that was the Oscar Grant case right because you never know yeah. stick it in your pocket you know it's smaller than a pack of cigarettes mm -hmm. and uh, the more of that that goes on that to me is a more important kind of, it's a way to massify the challenge and to not worry about, am I going to get press credentials? Because of course, we won't get press credentials from them. I, I guess it was, because I guess the it's- targeting, uh, The targeting. The targeting, uh, yeah. you know, the fact that they have no problem, you know, pushing you, grabbing your camera, mm -hmm. you know, and that. Yeah. and. As, and, and there's no way, you know, that people, it's hard to say, well, I'm press because it's not viewed as press in a lot of the sphere. And so, it's, you know, now that you can anticipate that, you can be mobile like everybody else. You don't stick around to have the argument <laughs> if you know you're going to have your gear taken away, you know, right? It's like, um, I, I would assume... I mean, you know, it's much more kind of formally done now and consistently done, but, you know, um, during the firebombing of ROTC in 1969 on UC Berkeley campus, I mean, I got rolled by the cops because they didn't really want me there, you know. So, I mean, I didn't throw the Molotov cocktail, but I was sure there, and, you know, there I was. Well. They didn't want that out. So, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not saying everything's the same, but, uh, I mean, I worked for a record. I had a press pass at that point. You know, it still didn't matter. The political relationship is what governs it, of course. And if it's going to be antagonistic, which one hopes that it would be, then that's definitional. I just couldn't get away fast enough, you know. Um, I mean, I had felony charges, you know, from that alone, you know. 
assault, I, you know, the, that's the typical charge, right? Mm -hmm. You're there, you're a witness, you're assaulting the cops. <laughs> um, I mean, we've all seen iterations of that. It was a good lesson for me. I was 19 years old. I said, oh, that's interesting. And it hurt, you know. Kathy, last question. Um, the organization I work for uh, had contact with the FBI a few years ago um, when we received death threats from the JDL. And we were just wondering, I, I was just wondering, do you see any role for any kind of legal monitoring of groups like, like the Klan, the Nazis, the Cuban, uh, right-wing Cuban community, um, or, or not. <laughs> well, like you do well, the L, which is Jewish Defense League, is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, which is, uh, yeah. I mean, should we rely on the government to surveil them? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, what, what, what would you do? I, well, I, I, mean, I, I mean, I don't want to just like be flippant about no, it. No, no, it's, it's the in, clan. In a, the clan still exists. Right. Yeah. But the party, the Black Panther Party, doesn't. doesn't yeah. Yeah. So they're, you know, do they have a special relationship to the state? Yeah. Yes, but of course. In our Even own, though they've yeah. been surveilled. Right. But it's also true that, you know, the FBI worked with the Klan yeah. and let them do shit for them, right. you know. So uh, I just don't think we're going to get any, you know, justice out of that, yeah. out of wanting it. I mean, you can demand a level of accountability yeah. and parity yeah. if you want. It, it was right. kind of a moral yeah. quandary I mean, yeah. that's why yeah. the FBI I, I was think, involved. I think if you do it, it's, it's yeah. got to be part of more of yeah. like a level of More agitation and education yeah. Yeah. because I think at the same time you have to you have to show what you know like the entire yeah. you know south was swarming with cops who were Klansmen right, for right. you know ever and yeah. still do yeah. you know in Buffalo yeah. we did an event um, last night in Buffalo and a pickup truck drove down the street and yelled you know white power outside burning books. I mean, this is not going away because of, you know, anything that the state is going to do about it. <coughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, we need freedom, man. Healthcare for all, a security plan. Reparation for black and indigenous fam. Self-determination for my sister and friends. Divide freedom. freedom. Is it just a point in the cuffs? Cause not being locked up just isn't enough. Divide freedom. Don't have to be locked in prison. To be a victim of this capitalist system. Come on, we want freedom. Self-determination for our people. Freedom. Equity in order to be equal. Said freedom. Nelson Mandela back on the screen.